Hey everyone, this is Mason Hutchison and welcome back to Herb Rally, your daily herbal podcast. We come out with new episodes about five days a week, so be sure to tune in often. Our goal for the show is to help you along your herbalist journey no matter what stage you're at. We have over 500 episodes, so please peruse those episodes. You're bound to find something of interest. We've got beginner classes, advanced classes uh, from all different teaching styles, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, Western herbalism, you name it. Uh, We've got different episodes about like what events are happening, upcoming webinars. Sometimes I'll just do these episodes where I talk to you for a few minutes about what's going on in the herbal community. Uh, So yeah, like I said, just please peruse the hundreds of different episodes and you'll find something that interests you, hopefully. Today, I'm really excited that we're having Juliet Blankspore on the show. Well, uh, really, they sent us recording of Juliet Blankspore from this class that she teaches. And basically, if you buy her book, The Healing Garden, uh, they hook you up with this additional uh, free course of sorts. So I'm going to leave a link to that course in the show notes. Uh, but I, I can't recommend this book enough. It's absolutely beautiful. If you know anything about Juliet's work, uh, the photography is always amazing, but of course the the herbalism is there too. She's been teaching herbalism for decades. Uh, in fact, let me read you her official bio. So Juliet Blankspore is the founder of the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine and the author of the best-selling book, The Healing Garden, Cultivating and Handcrafting Herbal Remedies. She's a bona fide plant geek with a degree in botany and over 30 years of experience teaching and writing about herbalism, medicine making, and organic herb gardening. But yeah, I remember I took a, a, a tree medicine course uh, with Juliet at the Good Medicine Confluence probably about seven years ago, and I was just totally blown away by her teaching style. And so I checked out her, her blog, which is called Castanea. And again, it's just really beautiful. Lots of great recipes on there. Lots of great herbalism. So if you're wanting to check out a great herbal blog, definitely check out Juliet's blog. I'm going to leave a link to her school, her book, and her blog all in the show notes. Uh, But really, I guess my point is I just really love Juliet's work. Uh, In fact, on her blog, Castanea, um, she has this recipe for a Hawthorne elixir. And I read that years ago. I don't remember when I started uh, doing this, but... Uh, Every year at winter solstice, I make this Hawthorne elixir, which was inspired by um, Juliet's recipe. And then, yeah, I just, I make cool labels for it and I give them to friends and family and whatnot. But anywho, like I said, so this is just audio from the bonus material that you get when you purchase her book. So uh, definitely buy her book and definitely check out her work. And that's going to do it for me today. So nice talking to you and I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Introduction to holistic herb gardening. Gardening is medicine for our body, our minds, our spirits. Gardening helps us stay connected to the earth, connected to our communities, to our healing, and to the plants themselves. In essence, growing medicine is medicine itself. So this sense of kinship with the elements and the seasons and the plants is deeply nourishing in a world that is increasingly divided by electronics and separate living and families that live in far reaches from each other. By nurturing a plant from seed to harvest and then to medicine, we're practicing an ancient skill that all of our ancestors once knew. Of course, we're also growing medicine in the literal sense. So medicine is all around us. Once you start going down the rabbit hole of herbalism, you'll learn that there are healing plants growing in our lawns, growing between the cracks of the sidewalk, growing in the woods, in the shrubbery. So healing herbs or medicinal plants can be annuals, plants that grow one year, flower, set seed, and die, or they can be perennials, herbs that come back from the earth every year again, or they can be shrubs or trees. People often think of low-growing plants as herbs, but an herb 
uh, is really, it's a useful plant. It's a plant that we might use for medicine, for flavoring, for dye, for fragrance. And if we can expand our idea of an herb, we're really like more in tune with the wide variety of medicinal plants that exist in the world. Growing your own herbs is one of the best ways to make sure that you have high quality medicine. So you can be more sure of the identity of your medicine. You can be more sure that it hasn't been contaminated with herbicides or pesticides or heavy metals. And also, if you grow every year and you harvest every year, you have the freshest medicine possible. In our modern era, it's easy to feel disconnected from our ancestors, our sustenance, from the earth. Growing your own medicine is one of the best ways to connect with your own lineage of herb growers because everyone's ancestors used medicinal plants as their primary form of healing. It's also one of the best ways to get to know plants. So if you want to get to know an herb planted in your garden, smell it, watch it throughout the seasons, and as you tend it, you're going to develop an intimate connection with that plant that hopefully inspires you to research more about its uses and eventually harvest it and use it for medicine. Throughout the Healing Garden book and our online courses on growing herbal medicine, we give a lot of strategies for growing medicinal plants organically. I don't think it makes sense to grow healing plants with chemicals. We know that herbicides, fungicides, pesticides contribute to the prevalence of cancer and also disrupt the hormonal regulation of our bodies and our development. So growing a plant that's meant to heal with chemicals that poison our own bodies, but also the bodies of the organisms in our bioregion just doesn't make sense. One of the best ways that you can reduce the need of insect and disease control is by interplanting medicinal herbs. So planting, let's say, an anise hyssop right next to a lavender, next to a white sage, and so on and so forth, instead of planting all of the same species together. When they're planted all together, it makes them a sitting target for insects and disease. So that is one of the best ways to reduce the pressures on your plant is to interplant. And you can think about varying heights and growth habits. So I plant hibiscus, a taller plant with like a vase-like habit under and underneath it, I plant spilanthes, which grows as a ground cover and calendula, which is more low growing. So that's an example of an herbal polyculture, poly being many, culture being growing. So you have many different herbs growing together. There's a ton of examples of different polycultures, and you can create your own groupings based on your soil, your habitat, your bioregion. I'm going to cover the four tenets of holistic herb gardening. The first one involves nourishing your soil instead of fertilizing your plants. So you're building up their home rather than just feeding the plants themselves. So there's many ways you can do this. Mulching is one of the best ways to nourish your soil. As the mulch degrades, it releases organic matter into the soil. Mulching also keeps moisture in and helps promote healthy microbial growth of your soil. You can also add compost to your soil composted manure. There's many types of organic matter that are soil building that I cover in the book. The second is to grow plants that love your climate. This is essential. So you can go through our 
sighting charts of different habitats and the herbs that grow in that habitat or climate. For instance, if you have wetter soil, there's a whole slew of herbs that you can grow. If you have drier soil or you live in an arid climate, there's a whole other set of herbs that will thrive. The absolute best way to know which herbs grow well in your area is to ask neighboring gardeners and herbalists what thrives in their garden. You can go to the farmer's market and ask herb growers what thrives in your region. We have several resources for you as well. So we have these regional profiles, which are written by herb gardening experts that live in different parts of North America. So you can look for the regional profile that best matches your area, and then also look at the sighting charts to see what matches your climate and bioregion soil type. The third tenet involves prevention over treatment. So we already mentioned polycultures and interplanting different species together. Planting native medicinals, so native shrubs and trees that also have healing properties, is the best way you can promote biodiversity and your environment. So native insects will feed on these plants and they in turn will attract birds and frogs, toads, small mammals that will feed on those insects. So you are promoting biodiversity when you plant herbs, depending on your region, but herbs like wild cherry, black walnut, sassafras, some medicinals are especially adept at calling in pollinators to the garden. So often these have really small miniature flowers combined together into a flower head. Examples of these um, generalist nectary plants are yarrow, angelica, fennel, and anise hyssop. Finally, the fourth concept is to remember that you are woven into a rich tapestry of life. The decisions you make, how you interact with your environment can affect generations to come of both humans and animals and plants. So choosing the most simple and natural methods for controlling um, problematic insects and diseases in your garden. So that concludes our introduction to holistic herb gardening. We'll get more into the nitty gritty of specific plants in the future videos. Oh,